All right, welcome everybody. Good morning. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn. Um, as you heard from John, we do a variety of Lunch and Learn. We're going to tell you more about it here, but uh, thank you for coming. It's a great uh, turnout today. Obviously, uh, the subject is of interest to lots of people here. All right, so this is one slide propaganda about Petro Management, and we mentioned that we offer a, a wide range of services uh, from modeling, simulation, um, water flood design, and there's lots of emphasis on horizontal well, multi-stage frag, because that's really uh, what the industry is doing mostly uh, with this type of uh, technology. Also, the one thing I'd like to, uh, to mention, that uh, uh, this item is very important to many people, uh, which is the integration of all the discipline to design your frag. So um, we obviously have uh, multiple talents to put the best optimum frag design for you. And what we wanted to say is, uh, when, when you approach a service company to frack your well, uh, obviously they have biases to their own frack. They have biases to give you the biggest frack so uh, there's more profit in that. But we, as a consulting company, we, ha we are neutral and we don't have any biases. So we can combine uh, all of these disciplines from reservoir engineering. We use the Kappa software for uh, design and doing all this in city on the multi-stage frack. Uh, we use the gopher, uh, uh, Tim, uh, Tim, you want to stand just so people can see you? So Tim is from FRAC Knowledge, uh, Tim, uh, he has a database on fracking and he, uh, he does all the gopher uh, design to give you the right frac design, the proper, the fluids, how much index, all of that. And of course we include any geological and petrophysical data. We combine all of this to give you the well frackability and finally give you the final product. How you're going to frack your well and what to expect. What is the optimum frack design? All right. So uh, this is the list of the variety of launch and land that we offer. Today you're going to listen about reserves for horizontal well with multi-stage frack, and we have interesting um, uh, topics here that is the industry uh, uh, focus of interest, like mini frack, defit design, design and analysis, um, multi-stage frack. Uh, designing and optimization, uh, water flood application, and this is coming on March 25th, by the way. So we're going to show you how to apply multi-stage fracking for horizontal well in water flooding. We tend to produce our wells in the primary, and we are content with 10-15% recovery factor. But if you apply water flooding, uh, we're going to show you how you can optimize it and achieve maybe 25% recovery factor. Um, database. Uh, Tim has a frag database that will be will be very useful for your frag design. So you know what the other uh, companies are doing, and based on that, you uh, hopefully choose the right frag. And also, uh, we combine, as we mentioned, the talent of um, uh, knowledge frag and pitch management to give you the optimum frag. So if you're interested of any of these uh, lunch or learn, we can do it in house if, if you have interest, and we can run it in your shop. If there is enough people interested, Tim. Uh, one particular thing you hear about frac data is that you know, is that uh, it has the most recent frac data, like some are able to get the most recent information. Thank you. All right. So uh, today, let's talk about the agenda. Today, we're going to try to finish just before one o'clock to leave ten minutes for questions and discussion at the end. So we're going to start with intro on tight, unconventional versus conventional. And then uh, we'll talk about the techniques that we have been using for decades on how to evaluate conventional reservoir and then we'll switch into the unconventional, uh, which have different tools because of the nature of the reservoir. And then uh, we're going to show you a case study on how to apply all of these techniques so you come up with a consistent uh, reserve estimate at the end. And then uh, we have closing comments and open for discussion. All right, reserves. Why reserves is so critical for the oil and gas companies? Obviously, a reserve represents the value of the company. The shareholders want to see reserves go up. Management, upper middle management. Obviously, they like to see the company doing well. Reserves are going up. More bonuses, improvement. Uh, even the employee also, uh, they, they like to obviously do the best they can to boost the reserves of the company. So this subject is very important. It's the livelihood of the companies. 
So why reserved estimate is a challenge? There must be many reasons for that. To start with, it is based on interpretations. Now, when we say interpretation, it's really, it's a mix of science and art. That means if you're not an artist, you're in trouble. You need to have that ability to visualize reservoir and come up with a reasonable estimate. Also, uh, one fact about what we do, that reservoir engineering is not an accurate science, and we have to accept that. I, I started as a mechanical engineer. I used to calculate everything to the third decimal. When I switched to petroleum engineering, I hit by the fact that we would accept plus or minus 15, 20% when we talk about reserves. So that's way different from what we used to in conventional uh, engineering. Also, uh, reserves estimate de is dependent on technology development. So let me take you back when I started my career, way back in the late 70s. I used to work for Amoco, and at that time, when we calculated reserves, it was based on certain cutoff values. So guess what we used for cutoff values for reserves? We used to use for sandstone 10% porosity, 1 milli Darcy. That's true. Anything below 1 milli Darcy, we walk away from. It. So you want to make money, go out and dig some of those wells abandoned back in the 70s with 1 milli Darcy. You find the loss of those around, we frack them now. 1 milli Darcy is a luxury these days. Uh, also, uh, the, the new technology that we use now with horizontal well multi-stage frack. Uh, some of my colleagues work for companies that they drill initially some wells in the Bakken uh, 25 years ago. Vertical wells, no fracking. This is the wells, and the wells are making five barrels per day. They walked away. Obviously, the whole story has changed now uh, with our multi-stage frack horizontal wells. Unconventional tight formations are definitely uh, more challenging to evaluate. To get basic information, it's a challenge. Like reservoir permeability, that's a challenge to get it. Reservoir pressure, that you think it's easy to get. Well, in these tight reservoirs, it takes a long time to shut in the well and try to get this type of information. When you calculate reserves, you need to know what the boss wants, right? That, that's, so when we talk about reserves, there's technical aspect, economic and political. That's unfortunately what happens in our business. We are under lots of pressure from the management to increase reserves. So think about, if you walk into the boss office one day and you tell him, I'm going to increase the reserve this year by 15%. Big smile, take you for lunch, and by the end, you're going to get a nice bonus for increasing the reserve, right? How about the opposite story? I, I recall a while ago, I went to my boss' office, and I told him, boss, I have bad news. We're going to cut the reserve by 15%. Well, I walked out of his office with a black eye that day. So really, uh, you have to also look at the uh, political aspect of what you do. All right. Oh. And also, I, I, I should have mentioned that, uh, also you need to have a good crystal ball to estimate reserves. The, and the reason why, there are so many uncertainties when you calculate reserves. Reservoir characteristics change significantly. So let's talk about crystal ball. This is one of the first crystal ball that we use in our business, black and white. Now you add the bits of witch craft to it, and maybe a little bit of light or psychedelic light to it so you can get better results. But I prefer this crystal ball. All right, so let's get into reserves now. Let's get serious now. All right, so we've been dealing with conventional reservoirs for decades. Those reservoirs have good permeability, good characteristic. And we had little problem estimating reserves. But now we're switching into the unconventional, like tight sand, the Bakken, cardium. Uh, all of these formations are very tight and uh, difficult to evaluate. But how about to get into shale gas or shale oil, CBM, all of these are more challenging reservoirs that we deal with and we have a bit of challenges. I, I like to teach people here uh, about shale oil and oil shale. Anybody knows the difference between those two? Shale oil and oil shale. You hear those terms and we mix them up. Shale oil is like shale gas. You already have the oil in the rock. All you have to do is drill horizontal well and fragment. Oil shale, the, um, or the organic material hasn't matured yet. So really you have the kerogene, you have organic material, but it didn't have enough pressure and temperature to actually produce oil. So we have to actually treat the formation by heat to be able to cook the organic material and make it mature. By the way, we worked on a big project uh, 
on optimization of horizontal well multi-stage frac in Colombia, and that was an interesting experience. Now, when we talk about tight formation, uh, light oil, tight light oil, we have so many um, uh, basins and reservoirs that we did with in our Western Canada. As you know, uh, when we talk about tight uh, light oil, the Bakken, uh, the Three Forks, uh, the Cardium, the um, Montney, all of these uh, are uh, interesting plates. And if you look at the production profile from tight light oil, you can see uh, layers, and but the profile is increasing. Uh, the bottom layer is the Bakken, obviously, in Saskatchewan. It's uh, significant. Uh, the yellow uh, is the Cardium. And I think the orangey is the Viking. But if you look at the profile, we're hitting 200,000 better per day easily now from the uh, tight uh, light oil. And of course, we use the multi-stage frac horizontal well for that. Uh, this is the same graph, but by province. Again, uh, the green is Saskatchewan because of the bucket. Now, we talk about conventional and unconventional. So let's a simplified uh, chart. It shows some of the conventional plays where you have structured traps or maybe stratigraphic trap. These are all conventional plays. Now, the unconventional uh, could be very tight sand as well, but it could be shale. So shale is our uh, most common source rock. And uh, these days now, we obviously venture drilling through the shale, which is considered a cap rock, a seal. You're not really supposed to produce from it. It's a seal rock. But because of the multi-stage frac, we obviously uh, we managed to break through and, and be able to make it commercial. Now, one simple approach or, uh, or observation Look at the size of these conventional traps compared to the size of a shale layer. The shale is massive. So you find that uh, shale reserves could be huge. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the percentage of the shale deposits on the earth, about 60% of all the sedimentary rocks is shale. So think about the potential that exists in producing gas or oil from shale. Now, this is a crowded slide here, uh, just to compare the conventional versus the unconventional. We mentioned that in the conventional, we have a localized trap where the shale deposits are massive. We're talking shale deposits anywhere from a few hundred feet to a thousand, fifteen hundred feet thick. Massive size and massive reserves. Um, in the conventional, you have the source rock separate from the reservoir. The oil and gas will migrate into a trap where in the conventional, your trap is your source rock. Your source rock is uh, the shale. Permeability in the conventional, if you go down to point one, that's still conventional. Uh, when we talk about the non-conventional, we get into nano and, mic and um, micro Darcy. Very, very tight formations. The reservoir acts like a tank in the conventional. What's that mean? That means when you produce a certain amount of oil and gas, the pressure will drop uniformly across the reservoirs like a tank. Where in the unconventional, when you produce a feed, the pressure will drop in the area around the wheel bore, and we'll talk about all of these definitions of stimulated reservoir volume, contacted reservoir volume, all of that in the unconventional. All right, let's talk about how we evaluate conventional reservoirs. We used to use decline analysis, pressure transit analysis. Still, we apply some of it in the unconventional, but when testing, for example, like PTA, becomes very, very challenging. In well testing, typically, we conduct a flow on a build-up test. You shut in the world for build-up to get to good reservoir pressure or permeability. Uh, when we talk about the monthly, for example, you need to shut in the world for six months or a year. Who's going to do that these days? I'm sure the boss is not going to be happy if you tell him, I'm going to shut in the world for a year to get the reservoir pressure. You're going to be looking for a job the next day. That doesn't work. Um, we're going to talk also about uh, rate transit analysis, which we use also in the unconventional. Uh, material balance, we use the material balance in the conventional, but this is what we call static material balance. We use static stabilized pressures. We can't achieve that in the unconventional because it takes a long time for the pressure to stabilize, so we get into a long production history, which is RTA, and we're going to go through all the different techniques in RTA. Uh, in the unconventional, because we don't have lots of history, sometimes we rely on analogous fields to come up with the production profile. So we look at the offset field in that area and try to come up with well types to help us 
to come up with the production forecast and estimated reserve. The list goes on, uh, the difference between the two, but basically when it comes to reserves, um, in the conventional, you like to produce the well until you reach pseudo steady state. That's when the pressure drop has seen the whole reservoir. Um, uh, that used to be done in the conventional. Uh, to reach pseudo steady state in the unconventional will take months, if not years. All right, now we'll just cover some of the uh, fundamentals just to help us get into the reserves. So let's talk about when you put the well on production and you hear the term, the well is in transit or the, uh, the well is under transit dominated flow. What, what's that really mean? So let's say this is my well. I'm just talking about a vertical well, a simple situation. I'm going to graph the pressure against time. You put the well on production, you see a pressure graph for me. And that pressure graph will reach up to this point, or what we say, the radius of investigation. That means only this area has been disturbed by the production, the pressure has dropped in here. But beyond this point, we have version reservoir. We cannot tell the size of the reservoir. If you keep producing more, the pressure drop has extended further. Still, it hasn't reached the edge of the field. That means we haven't seen the edges of the field. We cannot tell the size of the reservoir. And that's what we face in our tight and conventional reservoirs. You have to produce a long time until the pressure drop will reach the edge. When you reach to the steady state, that's when we can ask material reserves. So for this type of short test, or the, when the well is not stabilized, or it's transit dominated, all of these terms are the same, what kind of information we can get? Well, we can attempt to get the frac geometries. What is the size of the frac from the test data? The frac half length, the frac conductivity, the frac height. And that usually comes from when we see linear flow geometry or bilinear flow geometry. How about permeability and pressures? Well, uh, uh, those could be challenging. That's why I put the question mark here. Um, we can get them when we reach radial flow geometry, and that could take a long time for tight formations. All right, what if we produce the well for a long time? So when you produce the well for a long time, and the pressure drop will reach the edge of the reservoir, we are saying now we have reached pseudo steady state. And from this point on, I can tell the size of this reservoir. If you keep producing, now you see depletion in the field. So from extended flow, when you reach to the steady state, I can estimate the drainage area, and we're going to go through that exercise, and the oil in place or the gas in place. But just to give you a feel about reaching to the steady state, for the monthly information, let's say permeability 0.01 milliDarcy, it could take a year or so, to reach the edge of the drainage area of your well. Now, when you talk about shale gas, uh, the Duvernay, uh, Barnet shale, all of these tight, tight formation permeability in the Nano Darcy, it could take years to know the size of your reservoir. And sometimes you will never reach pseudo steady state when we talk about shale gas. That's the reality we are facing in the unconventional. All right, so for conventional reservoirs, that we uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we use conventional tools. We do the volumetric calculation. You have net pay map from geology, from seismic. Um, we use the static material balance. What I mean by static is like the P over Z plot, where all the pressure data are static, stabilized pressures. Because for the conventional reservoirs, we have reasonable permeability. You can shut in the well maybe for two or three weeks. You can get a good static pressure. So static material balance, like the P over Z plot for gas field, was used commonly for conventional reservoir. Now we have a difficulty with that. Decline analysis, when everything fails, we use decline analysis. It's the tool that we like to use, but obviously with caution, because we're going to talk about when you can use decline and when you can't. Um, well testing has been used for ages to help us understand also the drainage area for conventional reservoirs. So when we talk about static material balance, all you need is pressure data that are stabilized, are static. You grab them versus cumulative gas, and obviously extrapolate this relationship for conventional reservoir usually is linear. That will give you the gas in place. So this is what we call the material balance. We deal with the reservoir as a tank. That means if you take a certain amount of gas, the whole reservoir will experience a pressure drop. And this is what you need, production data and pressure data. 
So this is the material balance or the static material balance we are using for conventional reservoirs. All right, now uh, let's talk about the other technique, which is the volumetric calculations from a map. If you have a map from the geologist, you can estimate also the oil in place and the gas in place. So basically, we have two techniques to estimate the oil or the gas in place, the material balance and the volumetric. If those two techniques will agree, then the engineer and the geologist are friends. Because this is made by the geologists, the material balance by the engineers. So that's when uh, we, uh, we have a, a second opinion, the material balance versus volumetric to estimate the in-place estimates. All right, let's talk about decline analysis. Well, decline analysis has been around for a century, not really a century, but ARPS introduced decline analysis, which is just a graphical tool. You graph your data in a certain way and try to establish a trend of how your production rate is declining, extrapolate that trend to the future, you have your reserves. It's exactly when you look at your investment portfolio, you look at your stocks going up, you extrapolate, you know when you're going to retire. Agree? <coughs> I wish it works that way. All right, let's talk about decline analysis. To be able to establish a trend of how your production rate is declining, we have different tools. We have the exponential decline, and that's what we call a constant percentage decline. That means if you graph the rate versus time on a semi-log plot, you always see the rate magically falling on a straight line. Well, that's easy to extrapolate. We engineers we love straight line. You extrapolate the straight line, you come up with the production forecast and the remaining reserve. So the formula introduced by ARPS will be simplified for exponential. The value B is an ex exponent and a constant. It's equal to zero. And D is the constant that we get from the slope of that line. So exponential has been used widely in the old days for conventional reservoirs. Because with conventional reservoir good permeability, your data tends to fall on a straight line. And we always used to use a straight line in the old days. Even if data is curving, we fudge it. We put a straight line through it because that's all we like to do. In the old days, we had no computers. So look at the formula, quite simple. This is the rate in, in the future at time t, and this is the current rate, and this is the decline constant uh, in this formula. Now we'll get into the unconventional, and your data refuse to fall on a straight line. Your data tends to have a curve when it's declining. We can't cheat. We can't put the straight line through it. So we use hi hyperbolic or harmonic. Hyperbolic decline, it's a curve fitting, uh, has a value of B from 0 to 1. Harmonic, it's a value B of 1. So you notice that the hyperbolic has more application because the value of B has more flexibility from 0 to 1. So you find that the hyperbolic curve fitting tends to fit uh, closely more than the harmonic because it has a wide range of value of B. But the one thing we do, and we're going to expand on that sometime, we abuse the hyperbolic curve fitting. It says here the B should be between 0 and 1. And you'll find in some of our tight formation, like the Duvernay, the Horn River tight formation, the value of B, when you curve fit through your data, is over 1. And that is breaking the rule. So we'll talk about that. So what do we do uh, if the value of B is over 1? All right, so um, typically we graph our data, rate versus time, on a similar chart, and rate versus Q on a linear plot. And this is uh, a decline plot from the old days where you see a nice straight line. So if you just place two points on that straight line, so you have the rate Q1 and Q2, you take the slope. The slope of that line is the constant d. So the slope is y divided by the x. So it's the length of the y divided by the x. This is the y, the, the difference between those two rates. And the x is the time. That will give you the decline constant. That's not the decline percentage. It's a constant. So we take that constant and plug it in here. That will give you the annual decline rate for your well. Again, this is the old-fashioned the exponential decline that we have used for many, many years. Now, uh, we need to understand how we use decline analysis because we abuse it a lot. Uh, the decline analysis is based on a few simplifications or assumptions, which is we are producing the well at capacity. So if the well restricted, obviously if you extrapolate ex restricted rate, that will not give you the right forecast. So the well has to be produced at capacity. Also, we assume that we produce at a constant 
bottom hole flowing pressure. Uh, these are some of the assumptions that ARPS came up with in the old days. Uh, we produce until the well reach pseudo steady state, or we are in boundary dominated flow regime. Again, we abuse that a lot because in many of our tight formations, the monthly, doig, any of these formations, put the oil on production for six months, you don't reach to the steady state. But we still, we like to apply that decline analysis. So that's when we have a problem, and again, what do we do then if we haven't reached to the steady state? Also, uh, in the conventional days, the reservoir acts like a tank. You expect that the whole reservoir or the drainage area of the well we experience the same pressure drop, which is not true for the unconvention. All right, let's get into now the decline analysis and see how we're going to use it. We graph the rate versus time. So in the early stage of production, for tight formation, typically you see a sharp decline, and then you see a slowing down or stabilization. So this portion of your uh, history is what we call transient dominated. We have not reached to the steady state. It's always characterized by a decline, and usually for tight, tight formation, very sharp decline. In the first year of production, you might see a decline from 60 to 80 percent in the first year. But after that, you see stabilization. All right, let's say that we have a short history. We have reached to the steady state. I want to use my decline analysis. So let's say I only have a short history, just a few months of production. What do you expect in the first few months? The rate will drop sharply at 70, 80%. So if you use the early data and extrapolate your data, this is your flush production. If you extrapolate, all you're going to get is limited reserves. So that would give you a conservative reserve. If, you, if, if that's all the history that you have up to maybe two or three months. All right. Well, let's say that we have more history. So we have more history. We are somewhere here now. We are not in pseudo steady state. We are still in the transit, but we pass that flush area, that flush production. So if you try to extrapolate that part of your data and you are in transit and use, say, the hyperbolic curve fitting, you'll find that your data will curve up and you're going to see a B over 1. We are breaking the rules and you're going to get optimistic reserves. And we're going to show you several case studies when the B over 1 you're going to see your data curve up too much and you end up with uh, excessive reserves. So again, to summarize, the very, very early flush data extrapolation will give you a conservative reserve. When you get into the later part of the transient and use the hyperbolic curve fitting and with value B over 1, you get optimistic reserves. All right, so the evolution of decline analysis, it started way back by... Uh, jo Johnson and then improved by Arps in 1945. And Mr. Arps assumed constant decline constant. All your decline constants are one value constant. It does not change. So the improvement that has been made lately now, and this is the improvement that I like to mention, well, it can help us. Uh, when you still have transit or B over 1, we have a technique called power loss, power law loss ratio. It uh, was introduced by Elk back in 2008. And in this technique, uh, we use variable decline constant. And that's what we expect, variable decline constant. You always see that hockey stick profile. Initial decline, one set of decline, 60 to 80 percent. And later on, you see a decline rate of maybe uh, 6, 8 percent. So by having variable decline constant, uh, we can deal with the unconventional and the tight formation. So let me give you an example here of uh, a well from the monthly. We have a history here of maybe uh, two or three years. You look at the production profile, it's curving. Um, I'm going to do my best fit using hyperbolic curve fitting. So you can see the fit is not too bad, eh? It's kind of convincing, so people like that, a nice fit. But I have a value of B of 1.2. If I extrapolate that trend, it's going to give me uh, a gas, um, it's going to give me, uh, sorry, reserves of about 5.7 BCL. All right. Well, let me kind of massage that curve fitting. So I'm going to curve fit now with a different um, matching. And I come up with the B of 1.3. It looks like the same fit, right? Visually, it's the same fit. But I just tweak that B a little bit. It's 1.3. Hey, my reserve is going up. It's 8.5. It's getting better. 
Uh, you know, here I, I think I went down to maybe 50 MCF or so. You can use whatever economic limit you feel comfortable with. Based on times. Yeah, on the same abandonment rate. All right. Yeah, they're all the same decline, uh, or sorry, the abandonment rate. Now, let me kind of tweak that B value a little bit. And the B now is 1.4. It's the same. It looks like the same match to me, right? Visually, it looks the same. But look at the reserves. Boy, the boss is going to be happy with 12 BCF now. It's going up. So you can see that there is no unique answer. And the results can vary significantly from 5 BCF to 12 BCF. So what you're saying is, when you get into the B over 1, that's when you get into the grayish area, where the decline analysis supposedly is not going to work very well for you, because you're breaking the rules that was set by ARPS, and later on by many uh, authors like Fitkovich, uh, we're going to mention that later on. He said, do not use a value of B over 1. And I know lots of people are going to hate me for that. Because when you curve fit your decline, and your decline in the unconventional, you get the value over 1. And people say, well, what do I do then? All right. So back to the argument about the decline in transit when you have reached the steady state. Uh, we have to reach the steady state period if you wanted to get a good estimate from the client analysis. And again, the early values of B and D were constant, and that did not give us a good answer. Because in the first few years, you get 80% decline. Later on, the decline changed dramatically. So that's why uh, we're going to uh, talk about the other technique that the par law loss ratio, where you have two decline constants to accommodate the initial flush, the initial decline, and later on the slower decline at the end. And here's Fitkovich saying, do not use B over 1, and this is the reference, if you don't believe me. All right, so let's talk about that power law loss ratio, which is commonly used uh, for unconventional type formation. Your decline constant actually has two parts. This is the decline constant in the beginning, when you have that sharp flush production, that 60-80% decline in the beginning, and this is your terminal decline at the end when you reach stabilization or you're close to pseudo steady state. All right, so there was a paper actually published here, this is the reference, to compare the decline analysis using hyperbolic versus the power law loss ratio where we lose uh, the decline constant, the drops with time. So a study uh, looked at four wells in that paper, and I'm just going to show you the result from well number two. So if you look at the production history, uh, you see there is a red line and there is a black fit. The red curve is the power law loss ratio technique, and the dark line is the exponential decline. Well, they, they look kind of similar, right? Except you find here that the power law uh, loss ratio seems to fit better, just slightly better. But does, it, does that make a lot of difference? Yes, it does. I'm going to talk about the difference of the reserves using the ARPS, the decline, and the power law technique. <coughs> All right, so now we're going to show you the results from four wells that were uh, examined. If you we we look at the ARP, the hyperbolic decline, the first well has a B of 0.488, which is acceptable. The second well and the remaining wells, they have a value of B way over 1. So that is breaking the rules. What kind of difference of reserves do we get? Well, let's compare now the reserves uh, from the ARPS versus the power law. And this is well 1, 2, 3, 4. So well number 1, where the B is less than 1, that's acceptable. Uh, the reserves from the two techniques is called uh, similar, and the discrepancy is only plus or minus 3, 4%. So that shows for a value of B less than 1, the decline analysis is consistent with the power law technique. It, it's placing more confidence in our, my results. But once you get into a B of 1.4, 1.2, 1.6, look at the discrepancy between the two techniques. Usually, the decline analysis is always higher. So for a B of 1.6, your decline analysis is giving you 90% more reserves. So if you report these reserves, I guarantee you're going to be behind bars soon. You cannot report reserves that is 90% higher <coughs> than the reality. All right, so 
So what, what we're going to do, how we're going to evaluate our reserve, let's talk about all the tools that we use for the unconventional and the tight formation. All right, so initially what you like to do and what you recommend that you conduct many fracks. And I know lots of people say, oh, it costs money. I don't want to do it. Well, the mini frac uh, is quite cheap. All you need is inject water in your well for 10, 15 minutes and shut it in for follow-up. And we use what we call a defit analysis technique to analyze the follow-up data. The benefit of the mini frac, it will give you information that you cannot get from regular testing. Like what? It can give you a good estimate of the permeability. It can give you a good estimate of your reservoir pressure. Guess who needs this information? Your frac company. So whenever you design a frac, the frac company is asking, what's the permeability so I can design your frac? Well, I don't know what the permeability is. I need to test the well for a year to give you the permeability. Well, how about the mini frac? You can get results within a few weeks. You have a permeability, you have a reservoir pressure that we can use to design your frac, which will cost you millions. What else? Uh, once you put the well on production, uh, we can collect data and analyze by RTE, rate transit analysis. That means you flow the well for an extended period, you're making money. Put the well on production for six months a year and collect production data and pressure data. What I mean by pressure data is flowing pressures. You don't have to shut in the well. So you collect the data while the well is flowing. If it's a gas well, we can get away with well head flowing pressures because we can convert well head pressure to bottom hole because we always work with bottom hole data. However, that conversion is pretty good when you have dry gas. But if you start to get more liquid, then this conversion is not going to be good and we like you to collect bottom hole pressure data. If it's an oil well, we always like bottom hole flowing pressure data, not well head. Because with gas, uh, with oil wells, you have a mix of many phase fluids, gas, oil, and water, the well head pressure will not convert reasonably well to bottom hole. So you either have a permanent pressure recorder down hole, or when you buy your pump, like ASP pumps, they come with a pressure gauge. Well, you've got pressure data, free of charge. Or, if you like, you can shoot liquid level shots. And you're going to think, well, how often I'm going to get liquid shots? The well is, I want to put the well on production for a year or six months. Well, if you have an operator that can drive around with the truck, and collect even two shots per week. That's good enough. Because if you have uh, 50 weeks in a, or 52 weeks in a year times two, you have 100 data points of flowing pressure. We can use this data to analyze your production history. So, what kind of techniques would fall under the rate transit analysis? Uh, we have type curves that we're going to show you in a minute, Fitkovich, Blazing Game, and um, uh, agri-well as well. And there is another technique called the flowing material balance. All of these techniques do not require shut-in. All you need is history, production data, and flowing pressure data. And then we're going to show you also the power law loss ratio. How do we apply it and how it compares to the hyperbolic on a real case study that we're going to go through it in a minute. Of course, uh, if you don't have data, uh, you look at the neighboring wells. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, wind types and try to fit you well within the range of wind types that you see in your region or your basin. We're going to get into other techniques when you have that nice history. Instead of using those elementary tools, we use history matching. History matching, it could be analytical, it could be numerical. These are more advanced tools because not, not only are they going to tell you something about the size of your drainage area or the permeability, they're going to tell you your frac geometries. What is the frac half length? What is the frac conductivity? They can tell you a lot more advanced information that you can get from, from your history. So we'll show also some example of the numerical tools. How the numerical tools can give you also interesting results. So we have two techniques commonly used in our industry for testing. There is the well testing or uh, PTA, and this is the uh, production analysis or the rate transit analysis. When you test the well, like you have a flow on a buildup, basically, your rate is your input, and you try to match the collected pressure data. That's for like a flow on a build-up test. Usually you have a short build-up, you have very precise data, limited period. But when it comes to rate transit for the unconventional, you can collect data for a year or two. So it's a long period for analysis, and in this type of analysis, your input <coughs> is the pressure data, and you try to match the rate. Type curves. 
One of the first version of type curves was introduced by Mr. Fitkovich. Mr. Fitkovich, back in the early 70s, came up with this type curve. It's a graphical solution to your flow equations, basically. It's a dimensionless graph, pressure versus time in dimensionless units. And if you look at this graph, uh, you have same of curves in here. This is the transient data. So this one before the well is stabilized. And uh, this is the later data when you are in boundary dominated, the well is stabilized. So from the early data, if you all you have to do, you graph the rate versus time, because this technique is based on the Klein analysis. No pressure data is required because it's it's been introduced from the Klein analysis technique. In the Klein analysis, you don't need any pressures. So you're gonna graph the rate versus time on a same scale log log graph over late, get the match, and from the match of the early data, you can get the value of the perm and the skin. And from the match of the later data, if you got into pseudo steady state, I can give you something about the drainage area or the oil in place or the gas in place. So let's bring some data from one of your wells and graph it on a transparency and lay it over that chart. So here's my data coming in, bouncing. It's a rate versus time. Now we overlay it on this chart. We have a match. We've matched early data, the transient dominated, and we've matched the later data. So I can give you now information about your perm, the skin, and the drainage area. And what the software does, the uh, software will place like a reference point anywhere, as long as you keep the match in place and read the X and the Y values, and take those four values and throw it in the equation behind. I don't want to bother you with the equation. Nobody likes the equation these days. It's all in the software. And spit out those parameters for you. So that is the uh, Fitkovich type curve. Now, an improvement had to be made, and was made by uh, Blazingame, a professor from a and uh, Texas University. Mr. Blazingame said that there is a deficiency in the Fitkovich because it does not account for flowing pressures. It's only a rate versus time. So uh, Mr. Blazingame said, okay, we're going to take our data and we're going to graph now the production rate divided by the initial pressure minus the flowing pressure. So we are accounting for the flowing pressures. And instead of graphing it versus time, he came up with a new term, uh, which is called the material balance pseudo time, which is what you see here. This term is the cumulative production divided by the production rate. What's interesting about this term, if you look at the units, cumulative production is barrels. The oil rate is barrel divided by day or time. The barrel will cancel, you end up with the time. So you're really graphing your data against time. But the benefit of this Material balance through the time is the cumulative data tends to make your graph smooth, which means you can get a better match, better results. So here is the Blazingame type curve. Mr. Blazingame again said these curves represent the transient dominated flow. If you match one of those, you come up with the perm and the skin. And if you match the boundary dominated, usually it has a straight line with the slope of minus one. It's the fifth of which had many curves. But this is simply only have one line with the slope of minus one. That means if I graph my data, I can get uh, a better match of the data. So here's my data coming in, the rate divided by the uh, delta P, and again it's time. And you can see the match is nice here. I have reached to the steady state. So we can talk about the drainage area, and the early data will give me perm and the skin. All right, so the same thing, we place a reference point and read the X and the Y values, and that will give me uh, those parameters. All right, another technique that we like to use for the unconventional is called the flowing material balance. What's the flowing material balance? Well, let's, let's look at the well that is on production now for a long time. So if you produce the well for a long time, and the pressure drop has affected all your reservoir, well, that means I have reached through the steady state. You cannot estimate the size of your feed or the oil in place or the gas in place without reaching pseudo steady state. So the whole reservoir has seen a pressure drop or is producing. You have a pressure drop, you're producing. If you keep producing, everything, the pressure is dropping, depleting. Your reservoir pressure is declining and your flowing pressure is declining. We'll keep producing further, we're going to see further depletion. One interesting observation from this graph is it was noted that the decline in the reservoir pressure seems to be equal to the decline in your flowing pressure when you reach through the steady state or beyond. Same 
for additional production history. The pressure drop in your reservoir, this is the static pressure, seems to be comparable to the decline in the flowing pressure. Well, that's giving us a clue here. That means if I have the flowing pressure, which we measure at the wheel bore, I can convert those to the static pressure. Well, if I have static pressure, I can use my P over Z plot, which is your material balance for gas wells. So the first thing is we have a pressure recorder here measuring the flowing pressure. So I'm going to graph on the P over Z the flowing pressure, because I only measure flowing pressure, divided by the Z factor against the, the cumulative gas. Now, the software is going to use that concept that the drop in the flowing pressure equal to the reservoir pressure. It has an iterative process to convert this data into static pressures. So now I have static pressures. Run back to the P over Z plot. If I draw a straight line, I can estimate my gas in place or the oil in place. So this is the concept of the flowing material balance. Again, you need a long history to estimate the drainage area, the oil in place. You have to reach pseudo steady state to be able to estimate the size of your field or the drainage area of the well. How about well types? Let's say I have a lots of wells in my region and I want to see what kind of well types, what kind of production profile do I expect uh, in this type of formation or field. So here you see a bunch of uh, uh, well types from British Columbia. So the red one is the Horn River. And you can see we usually start at 6 million a day. That's kind of a type curve. And decline sharply and then less decline. The green is the monthly. So here we have uh, about uh, 2, 3 million a day. And uh, uh, this is the rest of British Columbia, and that's the average. So world types also is, is a tool that we can use. So this is uh, production history for many wells in the monthly. And normalized to time zero. So we bring all the production to time zero. And you can see there's kind of a, a, a scatter of production data. Well, if I use one of the software available to come up with what is the, um, what is the P10, uh, the P50, and, and, and the, oh, sorry, the, the, the P90, 50, and 10, we, we come up with the well type that will give you the 50% reserves, uh, the proven reserve, and the possible reserve. Uh, this type of uh, averaging, um, we have software like uh, Citron, Capanel, Citrain, or Harmony in FICAT. Uh, if you have a bunch of curves of data, it can give you your P90, your P50, your P10. And those would be your guideline to, to book some reserves. Or maybe, uh, so what you see here is again the P10, P50, uh, P90 for the Horn River. And uh, that came from uh, a bulk of wells that were looked at. And you can see the P10, the most optimistic. You start at about 10, 11 million a day decline, where the P50 in the Horn River, uh, we're talking here maybe 6, 7 million on decline, and this is the lowest uh, profile. Uh, this graph is from the United States for all or some of the major shell gas uh, basins. So you, you see the highest IP, uh, you see it in the Haines Bell, um, because it's highly overpressured. And you can see we start at 7, 8 million a day and decline sharply, uh, followed by the Marcellus and the Barnett is the green in the bottom. You notice the comments here. Interesting, it says uh, that the average average of all of these basins decline in the first three years is 84%. You decline by 84% in the first three years, which means that the bulk of your net present value of this project is coming from the first three years, your IP. Your IP is obviously very important in shale gas because of the sharp decline that you see. After that, you see very low production rate. Your cash flow is way down. So your payout is in the early part of your history. Uh, this is another chart just from the Eagle Ford. And the reason why I'm showing that, it's uh, similar to our Duvernay because it has quite a bit of liquid. And you notice when they reported the gas rate, they say million cubic feet equivalent because of the liquid. You convert the liquid to gas, so that gives you 9 to 10 uh, million equivalent cubic feet per day and decline. Again, the same comment, 30% of your expected ultimate recovery in the first year. All right, so we've talked about um, uh, the type curves, type wells. Now, how about history matching? You have one year or two years of production data and pressure data. I want a history matching. 
Well, you find that sometimes it's really tricky to history match your data, and uh, sometimes you cannot get a good match, or you get a non-unique match, it means any set of numbers will give you a match. So you can see the engineer here is very frustrated, because we can't get a good match. Well, is there anything we can do to achieve a good match? Well, obviously, uh, we have to use uh, other source of information to improve the match and come with a unique match as opposed to a non-unique match. So how do we do that? How we can come up with a better match or a unique match? We need to get additional information. For instance, okay, the flow regimes we can identify from diagnostic plots. We're going to show you that in a minute. I want to know my permeability and my pressure. Well, why don't you run a mini frac? And we uh, use a defit to give you an estimate of the perm and the pressure. That will totally improve your match. Because if you start with no knowledge blank of what the permeability is going to like, the software can give you a match with any value of permeability. But if you can get a quick estimate of the perm from your defit, now we narrow the range of the permeability. We tell the software the minimum is 0 0.01 millidarcy and the maximum is maybe point. Uh, 0.1 millidarcy. We put a range to get the match quicker and unique match. How about the effective length of the well? You drill a well that is 2,000 meter long, guess what? Only half of it is producing. Whoa, that's what we call the effective length of the well. How come? Well, half of the well is penetrated uh, a non reservoir rock or hit a damaged uh, part of the well bore or the well bore left the pay zone, drifted, and came back again. So what is the effective length of my well? It could be a wild guess. It could be any number. So now we're falling into the non-unique match. Well, why don't we use my gamma ray? If you ran open hole logs when you drill the well and you have some other logs, the gamma ray can show you what part of the well seems to, to have a reasonable value of gamma or it can produce. So now we're not in the range. I'm, I can get an estimate of my effective length from the gamma ray. All right? So you need to run a gamma ray. That doesn't come for free. How about my fracks? This is a huge unknown when we frack our wells when you have 15, 20 stage of fracks. When you frack your well, you have three unknowns per frack stage. Like what? The frack half length is unknown. The frack conductivity is unknown. And the frack height. Three unknown per stage. So if you have 20 stage, you have 60 unknown. There is no software in the world that can give you a unique match with 60 unknown. So, what can we do? Well, how about if we try to manipulate information available to us to guess what is the frac half length? Like what? Well, we have a graph, diagnostic plot, we're going to show you in a minute. You graph the pressure against square root of time. That's your producing time. That will give you a rough estimate of the frac. But this value is really the a theoretical value of the frac half length that is equivalent to all your frac stages. So if you take, if you come up with a number, you divide by the number of stages, it will give you the estimated frac half length average for your well. It's a tool that will give you a starting point. You need to start somewhere. Also, why not to look at the frac report? In the frac report, it says that we dumped 50 tons of sand in this formation. You can't have a 5 meter frac, frac half length with 50 tons dumped into information. You might have maybe 30 meter of frac or 45 meter frac, but not five. What if you frac one of your big wells in the Horn River or the Duvernay and you dump 200 tons of sand in this frac state? You frac half length maybe in the order of maybe from 80 to 150 meter. Where these numbers came from? Well, we've done a lot of analysis on fracs and we kind of, we have rough rule of thumbs if you dump so many tons of sand, we expect a certain frac half, half length. So you have to kind of dig into that and try to feel comfortable of how you're going to estimate uh, the, the frac half length. The frac height, if you have the same formation, usually the frac height is close to your net pay, usually. So what, what we're trying to do is reduce the number of unknowns as much as we can. How about the drainage area of the well? That's a big unknown. Well, you'll find that interesting that your type curve matching, actually, it's quite effective in giving you the drainage area of the well after that one or two years of production history. We're going to show you a case study of that. Also, your flow material balance is a good start to give you a rough estimate of your drainage area. 
So many fracks, we actually give a full lunch and learn on the many fracks. So I, I'm not going to go through how we analyze data, but basically when, when you conduct many frack, all it is you frack your well, you dump maybe 50, 30 barrels of water in that formation. So you can see the pressure rising up. You break down the formation, and then the frack is extending. Shut down the well. The pressure will drop suddenly to what we call the ISIP. And if you continue to let the pressure fall off, uh, the pressure will reach the point where the frack will close. So this part of your data is the injection. And this is the frack-dominated data where we can estimate uh, the closure pressure and the ISIP. If you keep allowing the pressure to fall off, which what you see in here, we get into the reservoir. So this is reservoir dominated and uh, from pseudos, from radial flow, if you have radial flow, we can give you an estimate of the permeability and the pressure. So again, a tool that will give you quick numbers on the perm and the pressure. Okay, let's talk about now multi-stage frac. How we analyze data from multi-stage frac. We need to understand the flow regime so we know how to analyze the data. So let's look at the uh, multi-stage frac. These are my fracs. When you put the oil on production, you find that the flows will enter your frac wings perpendicular to the frac wing. So that's what we call linear flow geometry. Your flow streams are parallel. That's linear flow. So when at the early stage of production, all you're seeing is production coming from this area here. So this area that you see here is the area where we frack the well and improve the permeability by fracking it. And this area, we call it the stimulated reservoir volume. So from the early production data, or even might take a few months or years, uh, all you're going to see is the gas in place or the oil in place in the stimulated reservoir volume. Once the pressure drop will connect between those two fracks, it means now you're depleting this area. You're going to start to, to see fluids coming in from outside the stimulated reservoir volume. And this area we call it the contact, conducted reservoir volume. Now we're getting production from outside the stimulated zone. Now that linear flow that you see in here could take a long time. Uh, apparently, uh, Dr. Blazingame uh, has done quite a bit of work in the United States on the shale gas, and, and he said that linear flow could last up to 36 months. And this is in the Barnet Shale, and as short as maybe uh, 9 or 16 months. So it takes a long time to get to the end of that uh, linear flow. All right, so let's let's look what the pressure derivative looks like uh, for a horizontal well, multi-stage frac. I used a, a very good permeability because I wanted to see all the flow regimes. Usually, uh, we deal with micro, nano, millidars. All right, so when you look at the pressure derivative, this is the delta P, this is the derivative plot. You're going to see the first um, linear flow. So uh, this data will fall on a straight line with the slope of half. Slope of half means linear flow. So you are really in the simulated reservoir volume. Once you go beyond the simulated reservoir volume, you see a transition in here. And then you get the linear flow coming from the outer zone. Again, uh, you're going to see a straight line with the slope of half. This is now your contacted reservoir volume. You're seeing beyond the frac zone. And at the tail end here, if you're lucky, uh, you're going to get the slope of 1, which would give you, uh, finally, your pseudo steady state, which would give you the size or the drainage area of the well. But this is really, really a uh, very long time, especially uh, here I use 1 million Darcy, and it takes, you know, maybe... Um, 12,000 hours to get to the pseudo steady state. Well, if the permeability instead of 1 milli Darcy is 0 0.001 milli Darcy, you will not get any close to that. All you're going to see is the first linear flow. So that's the common type of derivative we see. In many of our production history, uh, we see only that part of the data, the first linear flow. At the end of the first linear flow, you see your data curving. It's trying to give you a slope of 1. So I, I, I'm saying he's pseudo steady state, but I give it a star. This is really a full pseudo steady state. But it, it will give you the volume of the stimulated reservoir volume at all. All right, so let's, let's look at the case study that we've done in our shop, just to show you how we apply all of this technique that we, uh, we went through here. I know you, you probably 
you have a headache now from all of these tight curves and flowing through balance. But let me show you how we can apply it quickly for a case study. And I have a case study here from the Barnett chair. And the reason why I picked the Barnett, not our Horn River, because it has a long history. So long history, we can apply these techniques maybe better. So what we have here, uh, two wells in the Barnett chair. Uh, the first well, that you see here, uh, was completed, open hole completion. And the second one next door to it was completed case hole. Actually, this data was given to us by Packers Plus. Uh, Packers Plus did like the open hole completion, as you know. So they wanted to compare the performance of the open hole versus case hole. Which one is better? Also, there was some interest on, is the spacing between the horizontal will adequate? We have 490 meter between the two wells. Is that large or small? Can, can we try to improve the spacing between the wells so we can drain the reserves better? So we'll talk about that. Also reserves. Obviously that's important. Everybody wants to know the reserve. So we had, um, uh, they put this well on production. First, well A, which is the open hole. After a year and a half, this well was drilled and put on production. So we analyzed both wells so we can see what's going on. But I'm just going to show you the analysis that we use for well A. Uh, would be similar in terms of the approach itself. All right, so we're going to use all of these techniques that we've talked about from flow regime diagnosis, uh, if you have a defect, type curves, and we're going to use also decline analysis, the ARPS, and the uh, power law loss ratio, and, and show you the comparison. All right, so here's my history of well A, the first well that was completed open hole, and you can see the well is starting at 8 million a day and declining sharply. You can see what I'm saying in the first year, the decline was nearly uh, 76%. This is my Q production, and this is the bottom hole flowing pressure. So, how are we going to start? Or where are we going to start? Well, first we graph the diagnostic plot to see where we are. What flow regime do we have? So, uh, if you use diagnostic lines, you're going to find that at the end, uh, the data would fall on a straight line with a slope of half. That means I am in linear flow, which is expected. Even though we have four or five years of production history, uh, all you see is the linear flow. Now, another diagnostic tool about the flow regime, simply if you graph the rate versus time on a log-log graph, just the production data, you find at the early part of your data, your data would fall on a straight line with a slope of a quarter. That's what we call finite conductivity frac. It's not the best frac. But later on, you see that the data would fall on a straight line with a slope of half that's infinite conductivity. So what you're saying, you could have a mixed frac conductivity uh, while you put the well on production. Maybe the well is cleaning up in here, so instead of finite, you get into infinite conductivity uh, later on. But still, we haven't seen radial flow. We are mostly in the linear flow uh, geometry. All right? This is the square root plot. You, you graph the uh, production time under the square root against delta P you'll find that your data would fall on a straight line. That's an indication, again, that you have linear flow. And from that line, I can get you very important information, the frac half length. So we can estimate the frac half length. So when we get into history matching, you have work data to work with. We have some information about the frac half length. Let's use some of the type curves. Um, so we start with the Fetkovich type curve, and you can see here from the Fetkovich type curve, I came up with the gas in place of 4.2 BCF. Remember, this is the first type curve. It's the more primitive type curve. It has no pressure data, only production data. All right, let's use the Blaisen game type curve, which is more reliable, more advanced. What is the gas in place? Well, it gave me 4.1, so that's close. How about if I use a normalized rate against time, the agro -out? So, rate versus Q in production. If you extrapolate this data, it will give you gas in place of 4.3. Well, the numbers are kind of comparable, which is good. All right, let me use the flowing material balance. And you notice here, I mentioned excluding desorption. Desorption is the process of generating gas while you're producing the well from um, some of the unconventional, like shale gas and cool bit we see. So, if I ignore desorption, which is not right, I came up with the gas in place of 3.4. It's less than what we've seen from the past techniques. How about if I include desorption, which is what we should be doing? To include desorption, I have to introduce the Langmuir constant that you get from the laboratory. 
Now, what is the gas in place? Well, the gas in place is getting close now, 4.2. All right? Okay, let's use that power law, loss ratio technique. I'm going to try to match my data. And this is my, say, economic limit, 100 MCF. So the match is pretty good. Extrapolate. I come up with the ultimate, expected ultimate recovery of 3.6 BCF. Well, we like decline analysis, right? Let's use the decline analysis. So if I fit uh, my curve through the data, I come up with the B of 1.6. Can we buy into that? That's too high, right? So what is the ultimate recovery? It's 6.6. .6. It's 80% higher than the power law loss ratio that we believe is more accurate, more representative. All right. Let's look at the match of the power law loss ratio and ARPS. You can see the match here is not as good. The white is the, what the software has come up with. The yellow is the actual data. The match here looks more convincing. Okay, how about um, history matching? This is the most advanced tool that we have. We history match our data, and you can see that we use a multi-stage frac model. So we enter the frac parameters, all the frac geometry, and you can see that the match is pretty good in here for the production data. The match of the cumulative is perfect, you only see one curve, and the match of the pressure data is, is not too bad either. All right, so what is the uh, uh, gas in place from this match? What, 4.6. Everything seems to be consistent here. So uh, obviously from this match, we can come up with the frac half length. It's 160 feet long. The frac conductivity is 976 uh, millidarcy feet. We are using obviously the old system in here. All right, let's summarize all our results now. All right, so original gas in place. You notice that all the numbers are close except this value because I ignore desorption, which is not really proper. I just wanted to show you the flowing material balance with, without desorption. This is with desorption. So if I average the gas, the gas in place, it's about 4.2 BCF. How about the expected ultimate recovery? Well, here's the value from the power law loss ratio is 3.6. That gives us a recovery factor of 84%. And that's usually represent only the simulated reservoir volume only. How about my decline analysis? My decline analysis gives me a recovery factor of 154%. Which one would you believe? Obviously, 84 is more reasonable than 160%. All right. So how about numerical? We talked about analytical. Numerical tools are also very advanced. And it, it, the beauty of numerical tools as opposed to analytical, I can account for heterogeneity. I can account for different reservoir shapes where analytical usually they use one value permeability, one value porosity, and it uses a square or rectangle. So, it, it, so let's say that uh, uh, for those two wells from the Barnett that we just talked about, I came up with the perm here of 100 nano Darcy, a perm here of 36. So you can see here the variation of the permeability is done by geostatistical averaging. And this is the, uh, it shows the scale of the permeability. And the beauty of the, uh, the numerical, I can show you animation of the pressure profile in those two wells. So we're going to put this well on production first. This is the uh, open hole completion. And this well is still shut in. It hasn't actually been drilled yet. You see there's a pressure drop between the fracks. That's typical for open hole. And I'm just going to twist it left and right a little bit here. After a year and a half or so production, we put the second well on uh, production. And this is the case hole. So very shortly, you're going to see now this well is on production. And uh, if you count 1 to 10, it's going to produce. Here it is. So the well is producing now. You can see the pressure drop. This is a case hole. So you don't see a pressure drop between the frac stages because it's a case hole. And... Basically, it will give you some idea of the drainage area of the wells. So it's going to turn it around, and you can see that between the two wells, uh, if I move it up a little bit, there is no pressure drop in between. The formation is so tight that you cannot drain the gas in between. All right, let's summarize that. So you can see here uh, the two wells, and this is the pressure drop. No pressure drop in between. That means that the spacing... Uh, 480 meter is too generous. We need to bring them closer. And that's what we see in our Horn River. 
the spacing uh, is much less than that uh, uh, in, the, in the Barnett gene. Now, again, why do we go numerical? Well, I can, I can, I can account for heterogeneity. Here we have a high permeability point 2. This is point 01. And you can see that the software can distribute the value of the permeability using geostatistical uh, tools. So obviously, what part of the world will produce more when you put the swell on production? The high permeability. The point, the point two as opposed to point zero one. So with numerical modeling, I can change the shape of the reservoir, I can put faults, I can account for heterogeneity, and also I can generate isobaric contour maps. So after producing the one for so long, you can see here where the high permeability is, I'm draining a larger area. And for a low permeability, I don't uh, drain too far from the well. So the uh, isobaric contour also could be generated from numerical model. And you can see here that the pressure drop is just around the simulated area. As time goes by, the pressure drop gets into the outside zone, the intact reservoir volume. And finally, you reach the picture that looks like this. All right? So, uh, I think I ran it for about a year, year and a half, but you can run it for any extended period. So if, if you can see the area that has seen the pressure drop, I can put a zone in my software, and I can tell the software, what is my gas in place in that area? Well, it's going to tell me in that odd shape, isobaric contour map, I have about, say, 5.2 BCF. So the numerical model is more advanced than analytical, and you can get interesting information out there. All right, so let's uh, summarize the reserves issue. Uh, when you have a multi-stage frac, you have the simulated reservoir volume for a short history. This is the area that has been improved by fracking. There is a contacted reservoir volume. If you go beyond that, if you have a longer history or better permeability. Well, how about the old-fashioned definition, the P90 and P50 and P10? How do they fit in that? Well, if you have a production history, a short production history, and you extrapolate, this is a short history, so what you're going to get is probably your simulated reserve volume, which is your P90. If you have a longer history, and you get into the contacted reservoir volume, you go beyond the frag zone, uh, you have longer reserves, and this is your P50. And that's based on reasonable drainage area. But if you really push your luck and use a larger, maybe optimistic drainage area, or use the value of B over 1, that's going to give you your P10. This is when you really push your limits when you have a B over 1. All right, so let's uh, close our discussion here. Uh, basically, the tighter the formation, the more challenging the reserves calculation. You need more time. A production profile uh, could be generated also based on offset wells, analogous wells, but with caution. Remember, we have high heterogeneity in our field, so your well might not be exactly the same as an average well in that region. And also, the Klein analysis could be used, but again, be careful. Uh, if you are in the transient dominated and use a value V over 1, it's going to be too optimistic. And of course, uh, we can add more tools to improve our reserves. If you have micro seismic, if you have the pressure surveys, all of these tools will definitely add to the uh, accuracy of your reserves. And that takes us to the end of the presentation.